Morning, brethren. You know, I think what we have here this morning already demonstrated in these three sermons is a, uh, what I call a feathering together of our sermons. We're like painting a picture is what we're doing. One picture. We're all kind of coming up and giving our part of the picture, and there's some overlapping that is taking place. Brother Dan, he's already been talking. You've already been talking on my sermon, Brother Dan. And we're not threatened by that at all. What we're also doing here is we're building a wall like in Nehemiah's day. Remember, they, uh, they had the responsibilities of the wall that was separated in different companies. And as they were all building the wall, remember, they came together at a joint and they had to fit together. But it wasn't like a flat part of a wall coming against a flat part. There was like an overlapping. That's what makes a wall strong is there's overlapping. And so what Brother Dan did is he just provided overlapping for my text, and now I'm going to fill in the overlapping points, and that was a confirmation to me that I'm on the right track, you know. Amen. Glad for that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10 is where we're going to be this morning. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above, far above all heavens that he might fill all things. You know, the one thing I love about the life of Christ, both that which was lived in the earth and that which is, of course, continuing on now, is that everything Jesus is and everything Jesus does is unique to Jesus. There's nobody that's like Jesus. Even in Jesus' birth, it was a marvelous birth Jesus was born, and yet he hath neither beginning of days nor end of life. That's pretty profound. He did not begin to be when he was born, see? And think about this fact, that his was a virgin birth. He is the only begotten of the Father. And at his birth, angels worshipped him. I don't know about you, but I haven't been through the neonatal wards and seen angels worshipping babies there. They, but... At this birth, angels worshipped him. And how about at his baptism? The scripture says that the Holy Spirit ascended down in the form of a dove upon him. And I haven't seen any doves coming down on people in their baptism, although the Holy Spirit did come down upon them. And also at his baptism, God spoke audibly, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, I haven't heard that in anybody else's baptism, him audibly speaking out of heaven. These are things that are unique to Jesus. In his miracles, Jesus could pay his taxes with fishing. could do that. <clears throat> and he didn't even have to go fishing. He could guide the fish to Peter. Peter could do the fishing, and then they could pay their taxes. I don't pay my taxes that way. Jesus can rebuke the sea, and when he did, remember, the disciples looked, they stared at Jesus and said, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Have you ever tried to do that? Give it a try. This is unique to Jesus. The resurrection of Lazarus was somewhat unique because, as Martha said to Jesus, he hath been in the grave four days, and he stinks by now. He was corrupt. Well, I'll tell you what, if Jesus can raise someone back who has a body that's corrupt, he's got no problem delivering up ashes and bone. He can do this. This is our Savior. In the work of salvation, he is most particularly unique. For example, he did no sin. Anybody in the room today can say that? That was Peter's summation of his entire life. He did no sin. I know some think that, I know some think the righteousness of Christ on the earth is merited to us, you know, so that they don't say this, but this is what they mean, so we don't have to do what's right, you know. He, he did what's right, we don't have to, you know. He did no sin so that he could be an offering for God. You wonder why. You wonder why God so loves his son? Why he is, he is the beloved? It's because of who he is and it's because of what he's contributed to salvation. He's given the most. Amen. 
and he is loved the most, and of course, the accomplishment of his death. Most significant. Jesus' death is the only accomplished death. It's the only one. It's the only one that has actually produced something. Amen. Daniel said in his death that he finished the transgression. He made an end of sins. And to make reconciliation for the iniquity. That's the transgression of Adam that he finished. He finished sin at its root. Paul said that he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's why he came into the world. And so when we see Jesus from this light, what the ascension of Christ really is, it's God's response to what his son has done. Therefore, he hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That's what it is. So really what salvation preeminently is about, it's about the father loving the son and it's about the son loving the father. That's what it's preeminently about. It's not preeminently about us. We're involved in the process, but this is preeminently about Jesus providing a people unto God and God providing a bride for his son. That's preeminently what it's about. When you can see it that way, it'll be most, it'll be most edifying to you. The scripture says this of Jesus, that he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That's how God wants it. That's how it is. So that he might have the preeminence, see? Jesus is to God what Benjamin was to Joseph. That's what it was. Remember when he was reunited with his brothers and they ate together? It says that Benjamin got five times the portions that the other brother got, right? And when he gave him garments, all the brothers got a change of garments, but see, Benjamin got five times as many garments and quite a bit of silver. So that's how God wants it, and that's how I want it. Isn't that how you want it? Amen. I'm just saying when we talk about the ascension of Christ, we're saying that God has done a marvelous thing. That's what we're saying. It is a profound thing. I can tell you the difficulty with which I wrestled with this text. I picked this text and then I thought, why did I? This was a profound text. Not why, like I didn't enjoy it, but it, there, there's a lot of labor that goes into this because this is a profound thing, what God has done for his son. You know it's going to be, be, be profound if it's an expression of God's love for his son. You know just by, just by that, that it's going to be a profound work. Now, the very fact that this ascension has been addressed in so many different ways in the scriptures tells you it's quite profound. For example, the scripture says that he set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Or that God hath highly exalted him. Or that Jesus is passed through the heavens. Or he has entered into heaven itself. He has ascended up far above all heavens. And when you talk about the works of men, you can basically say it one way and you've covered it all. But when you talk about what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, you've got to say it a lot of different ways. You've got to say it a lot of different ways. Because it's a profound work. I do not like ascribing to Jesus average works. I do not like ascribing to God average things. Amen. There's a lot of this going on. But when we talk about the ascension of Christ, we're not dealing with something that's average. This is a marvelous and profound thing that has been done. Now let's look at this text. The manner of Christ's ascension. He ascended up far above all heavens. It is an upward ascension. You know, the Spirit didn't think it was enough to say that he ascended, although we can assume by the term ascended that he went up. But it says he ascended up. It's not redundant. It's making a very important point, and this point is made in the record, brethren, of his ascension over and over again. It is an upward ascent. Mark 16, 19, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he received, he was received up. I like to think about that. I like to think of Jesus as being received. I like to think that there is a reception on the other side of the veil of the natural order there waiting in an expectation for him to 
enter in there. He was received, but see, he was received up into heaven. Say, did Jesus literally go up? Yes, he literally went up. That's what the text says. Luke 24, 51, it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight, confirming literally he went up through the clouds. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel while in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Stephen, one of the first martyrs we know of in the church. And when they went about to stone him, the scripture says that he being filled with the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Amen. Jesus, or Stephen knew exactly where Jesus had gone. He had gone up. He knew the direction to be looking. Amen. When men are full of the Spirit, that's what they do. They look up. They don't look down. They don't look down. See, brethren, in your afflictions, don't look down, look up. Where has Jesus ascended? He has ascended up. Don't look down. Fortunately, I've been in the camp of looking down. Boy, I've been beat up by that. There's nothing but dirt under your feet. That's all it is. Jesus didn't descend down. He ascended up. Where is he? Look, brethren, to the place where you have been hid in Christ Jesus. See, it's upward. See, I'm telling you, this understanding that Jesus has ascended up, when that registers upon your heart and mind, it has an impact upon your conversation. For example, Colossians 3, 1 and 2, we are encouraged, seek those things which are where? Above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. If you want to have fellowship with Christ, you're going to have to set your affections where he has been seated. And he ascended up. That's where he ascended. So he says, set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. You know this truth of him ascending up affects our praying. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Sometimes you'll see the brethren among us doing just that very thing, lifting up their holy, lifting up holy hands. Why? For the acknowledgement of where our Savior has ascended to. See, that's what that is. And even when we pray, we close our eyes and consciously we pray upward. Right? I mean, I'm not trying to get as low as I can in my conscience when I'm praying. I am in my mind and heart ascending upward. Why? Because he ascended up. That's where he went. That's where he went. In other words, I've got an intercessor in heaven so that when I'm praying, <laughs> I'm thinking in terms of that intercessor being there on my behalf. Jesus, can, Jesus like gives strength to your prayers. He'd do that. He gives strength to your prayers. He's ascended up. In fact, this truth of him ascending up actually encourages our speaking. We having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. If you know the context there, Jesus or the Apostle Paul is talking about a measure of sufferings that we all have to go through. Tribulation, trouble, distress, and things like this. Things that are, that are like trying to pull you down. They're like drawing you down. And sometimes they can do that. For a moment, sometimes you find yourself in the valley. But in the remembrance of where Christ has ascended, power is funneled from heaven and you're back up again. Right? See, this is a marvelous truth that he has ascended up. To what degree? 
far above all heavens. Now, I'll tell you right now, I sought to try and put parameters on this, and I can tell you right now, you're not going to be able to put parameters on this. It's not really that kind of, well, this doesn't mean that, and this doesn't mean that. No, you need to go into this thinking, what does it mean? And it extends beyond. After we've got done saying everything we have to say about the ascension, all of us will have the testimony and witness of the Queen of the South. The half has not yet been told. So I'm just gonna, I'll just give you what I got, and that's all I'm going to give you. Far above all heavens. I read some of the commentators on this. The heavens referring to that starry host. From one sense, and it's already been testified in the scriptures, he ascended up beyond the skies. The heavens in the scriptures are often, refer, often referred to as the heavens. The sky is often referred to as the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God as firmament that showeth forth his handiwork. See, right? So we know he ascended up beyond that, beyond the sky where the clouds are, but it extends even beyond that. It is all heavens. It is not just the sky heavens. It is that starry firmament that goes beyond that we call the universe. He ascended up far above all heavens. All heavens. What a marvelous thing this is. You know, I, I thought, how, how do you explain something like this? And, and how do you bring this about? So I thought of the priesthood. This is something that's been lively to me as of late. The most important day of the year to the Jews was the Day of Atonement. Most important day. Here's where the, the sacrificial lamb was sacrificed. The scapegoat was let go. Right? Most important day of the year. But do you realize not a single soul in the camp of Israel saw that high priest do what he did on the Day of Atonement? Because he entered within the veil. And not a soul could go in there. Nobody saw it. Now, brethren, that's the sense in which Jesus has ascended up far above all heavens, okay? He has ascended to a place where we, we cannot see him. See, we cannot see him. Think about it this way. Jesus said, the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, not because you'd have some kind of telescope to get way out in the universe or to have a space shuttle to get out far enough to where we can finally get to them. This isn't distance language. This is language of faith. He extended, brethren, beyond the veil of the natural order. There's another way of saying this, that he has ascended into the presence of the Father. Or the scripture also says in the language of the priesthood that he has entered into a tabernacle not made with hands. That's it. That's how far he ascended up, brethren, because that's how far he had to ascend in order to get us the resources. Now, I love this. Far above, far above all heavens. Now, to what end has he ascended? What's the purpose of this? Because there's nothing that God does that he does without a purpose. Everything he does has a purpose to it. Amen. Why does Jesus have such an exalted place? Why? That he might fill all things. Jesus is our Joseph. That's what he is. You remember Joseph, when he was a young man, had received a couple of visions from God. One, remember he was out, he was in the vision, he was with his brother, and they were all binding sheaves together, and his sheep rose up above his other brother's sheaves, and their sheaves did ambiescence to his sheep. And then another vision he had, remember, he said the sun and the moon and the 11 stars. That must have really got at those brothers. The 11 stars bowed down to him. Joseph was told right at the beginning that he was going to be a man greatly used of God. He was going to have an exalted position. But before Joseph could have that exalted position... He had to first descend. 
You remember, he was sold as a slave because his brothers were envious of him. Sold as a slave into Egypt, he had difficulty in Potiphar's house, ended up in the prison. He that descended is the same also that ascended up. Brethren, before you go up, you got to come down in God's kingdom. That's really how it is. You got to humble yourself. Don't, brethren. This was a great difficulty for Jesus, I can tell you. Not difficulty because he wasn't willing to do so, but this was a hard thing. But for us, is it really a hard thing to humble yourself? It's, it's hard on our flesh, isn't it? But let me tell you, whatever, you're, whatever God is doing right now that is, that, is created, that is causing a measure of humility you, that is required, you have to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Encourage yourself by looking to Jesus. See, he didn't stay in a humbled state. Jesus isn't in a humbled state now. Joseph didn't stay in the prison, right? He ended up on the throne. And on a throne of just any kind of power, this was like a world, an unequivocally challenged power, the world power of the day, so that he was only second to Pharaoh in the throne. Now, why? Why go to Egypt? Because that's where the corn was. Time came when the famine came, and it was everywhere. Remember when it was in, it, the famine even was in Canaan, remember? Where Jacob was, where Jacob had to tell his brothers, he said, why are you looking one on another? There's corn in Egypt, get up and go. I feel like saying that sometimes to people whose conversation is in the world. Quit looking one to another. Let's start looking up. Where is the corn? Is the corn where your talk is? Then get your talk in the place where the corn is. I know some people, they'd outsource it. They'd have left Joseph in Canaan and outsourced the corn to, to Canaan. That's ridiculous. Isn't that amazing that people are trying to seek resources where there aren't any resources? Humble down, ye inhabitants of the earth, because it's nothing but famine. David said, this is a dry and thirsty land where no water is. So quit looking around one to another and consider him that has ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. That means Jesus went to the place where the distribution of the corn takes place. It's where the corn is. Because if you're going to get any resources to be prepared for the day of judgment and to be prepared to be a bride for Christ, you're going to have to get the resources from heaven. They don't come up from the earth. They come down from heaven. Jesus came down from heaven. The Spirit came down from heaven. If you get grace, you get it from the throne of glory that is in heaven. Faith came down. All of these resources we get from God, they come down. Why? Because our Joseph has ascended up into heaven and he's filling our sacks with corn. Amen. That's what this is. Amen. He's filling us. I like that text. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You will never out-hunger and out-thirst Jesus' ability to fill. Now, this is what salvation's all about. You want to develop a healthy appetite that Jesus can fill. And the bigger your appetite is, the more satisfaction you have when Jesus fills it. But the guarantee that you'll be filled is that he ascended up far above all heaven so that he might fill all things. Demonstration, day of Pentecost comes. The disciples are there. The scripture says the sound, a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind came. And tongues of fire rested upon those disciples. And remember they began to speak of the wonderful works of God in the tongues of all that had gathered together into Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. Well, some had thought they were drunk. That's what this is. They're drunk. So Peter, being filled with the Spirit, rose up and told them, this is that which the prophet Joel spoke about. I will pour out of my Spirit. That's what that was. 
And Peter gave the explanation. Therefore, him being exalted by the right hand of God and having received of the Father the gift of the Holy Spirit, not received to himself, received to give, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. And 3,000 souls came to the Lord that day. What was that? That was a demonstration of him that ascended up far above all heavens, filling all things. Amen. That's what that is. I'll tell you, Jesus wants you full. Amen. No quarter full, no half full, no three quarter full. He wants you all full. Amen. In fact, that's how it's going to end up. In the end, it's going to end up everything that's in you is going to be full of the fullness of God so that he might be all in all. Jesus is in, in that project as we speak. You know, the scripture says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Singing one to another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. You realize what a wide range of hymns and spiritual songs the church has been given? You know, I was, I was part of the praise movement for a while, so if you're, if you're gung-ho for the praise movement, please don't be offended by what I say, but it was a very bad thing to get rid of the hymns. I'll just say it that way. We have such a wide range of hymns that have been given to us. That is a demonstration of Jesus filling all things. It's like, a, it's like a demonstration of that, like an abundance of it. It's amazing how many hymns we have. That's the work of Jesus. He's done this. Now, I'll tell you right now, brethren, do not subject yourself to a song that will not fill you with the word of God. Because that is not what Jesus does. He is in the business of filling all things. And so if you're subjected to a song that has a thimble of truth in it, plug your ears and get a different one. And if you wonder whether it has a lot of truth in it, get rid of the soulish music and read the lyrics. Because he wants you filled with the word of God. In all hymns and spiritual songs, that's the work, that's the work of our God. Glad for it. How about this one? You know, a consecrated life is actually the product of Christ filling a person. That's what it is. Colossians 3.17, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, yeah. Spiritual life can be pretty detailed. It can be down to word and deed. How about that? There's too much talk of people talking about they're alive. Okay, you say you're alive. Now let's look at your word and your deed, and that'll tell the story. Some people, they do, I know this is like theoretical because I know Jesus doesn't give like a thimble of filling to people, but some people, they get enough, so to speak, fuel from heaven on a Sunday, but boy, before they've even left the sanctuary, they got it all burned up, and they're living for themselves again. God wants you full. He don't want you to just be that, as they say, the Sunday Christian. He wants you full, see, so that the fuel you receive on Sunday can stay with you and last like Elijah's meal. It can stay with you like 40 days. Brother, if you're subjecting yourself to a preacher or some truth and the fruit doesn't last, move on. Amen. Jesus wants you filled Filled. The scripture says that he can fill us with all joy and peace in believing. The apostle Paul said, I myself am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you are full of goodness. See, these are all things Jesus is doing right now. In everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. That's fullness. Are you speaking better about the Lord? You're being filled. That's what that is. It's a product of fullness. See? And so the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you when you're full, when you're filled. In our diligence and in our love, therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and, all the, and, and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. See? 
This is the characteristic of Christ's ministry of filling all things. You abound. That's the way it is. But now listen, there is one common thing in all of these things that I've just said. All of these are expressions of divine traits that are in Christ Jesus. All of them. Essentially what Christ is doing in filling all things is filling you with himself. We must come to this understanding that the dispenses of resources is not the end of the matter. It is to an end. The filling all things, that's not the end of the matter. It's for a purpose. And he tells you exactly what that purpose is. He tells us even in that text that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for what reason? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Just having a lot of resources, that's not it. It's about using the resources and growing up into Christ Jesus. That's what it's about. It's about growing up, brethren. That's what it is. This is the red print, brethren. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's what he said. Be perfect. Don't be content with anything that's less than perfection. There's too much talk like this or too much testimony like this today. I get the sense that people are satisfied with being imperfect. I think some people would be well satisfied if they stayed in a state of imperfection as long as they were received by God. But that will not happen. Amen. That will not happen, brethren. The target of all this plethora of resources is that we might all grow up into Christ Jesus. It's for the perfecting of the saints. That's what it's all about. 2 Corinthians 13, 9, We are glad when we are weak and ye are strong, and this also we wish, even your perfection. See, how many preachers out there do you know that express that to the people? You know what my wish for you is? is that you be perfect. Hmm? That's the target. That's the target. Perfection. Perfection. Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. You know, there are some, brethren, there are some churches that mainly what they're doing is emphasizing these first works. I'll give you an example. This has been said in our assembly, so you've probably heard this before, that spiritual life is this. It is a life of continual brokenness over sin. That's what it is. That's what, that's what spiritual life is. Really? That's what the scripture calls laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. And if you keep laying the foundation, you're never going to grow up. We, don't, we do not forsake the foundations, but we build on them. Because if you don't go on to perfection, it really doesn't matter that your sins have been washed away. There isn't comfort in that. That's the truth. There are people that talk a lot about the forgiveness of God, and we're glad they do. We're glad he's put sins away. We're glad for that. But if you don't go on to perfection, you miss the entire point. Amen. There isn't safety in that if you don't go on to perfection. And these brethren in this text in Hebrews were in danger of cursing. Because by the time they should have been teachers, and they weren't. Now I'm telling you, preachers aren't telling, the, telling people this today. They aren't tell, you, you know by the comfort that people find in remaining in babyhood in Christ Jesus for 10, 20, 30 years. But the people have got to be told, you going on to perfection, that's the goal. That's why Jesus has ascended on high, to fill all things for this intent, that the saints might grow up and be perfect. But even that, brethren, is not an end of itself. It's not an end of itself. Maturity leads to work. It leads to work. 
You know, in the scriptures, there's a marvelous demonstration of this in the scriptures. You know, Moses had some difficulty, no small amount of difficulty, as Luke would say, being a faithful minister in all the house of God, but he did it in Israel. You remember, uh, this is a marvelous example of bad communications, corrupt and good manners. But there were those that had, that had come with Israel when they came out of Egypt, and they got to grumbling about the food. Oh, those leeks and onions, those melons we had back there, and they sent the Israelites into a state of grumbling so that as Moses was going throughout the camp, at the door of every tent, he could hear grumbling. This was a burden. Moses made his plea to God that this was more than he could handle, and God heard his prayer, and he said this, I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, that is, the 70 elders among Israel that were to meet at the door of the tent there before the living God. I will take of my spirit, of, your, of the spirit which is upon you, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. Now, it wasn't that he took the spirit of something else or somewhere else and put it on them. He took the spirit of Moses and put it on them. And it isn't that the spirit was put upon them and then they went about doing different works. The spirit of Moses was put upon them so they could enter into Moses' works. That's what it was all about. Now, brethren, that is what is happening here. That's what the, this fullness is all about. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What he's done is taken of the spirit of Christ and he's put it in you so that you will grow up. And as you grow up into a state of perfection, you enter into the work of what ministry? The ministry. That is his ministry. And what is that ministry? The edification of the body of Christ. And what is Jesus doing today? We got all kinds of people saying they got a ministry and they don't seem to be doing what Jesus is doing. Something's wrong here. That's not what this fullness is about. It's filling you so you can enter into his ministry. Right? The edification of the body of Christ. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but of the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. We all got a measure. Everybody in Christ, you have a measure of the fullness of Christ. Some measure of equipping from Christ that enables you to minister like Christ. To effectively minister. You've got that. For the profit of us. Of all. See? The profit of the assembly. The profit of the body of Christ. Is which, what he goes on to say a little later there. The body of Christ. That's the preeminent ministry. That's the ministry. It's not the ministry you do when you get beyond the four walls. It's the ministry you do within the four walls. It's building up the body of Christ. I'm not saying there's not a ministry out there, but I'm saying the primary ministry is to the body of Christ Jesus. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. So if you want to know whether you are growing up into Christ Jesus, then it will be confirmed in the assembly among God's people. As you grow up, you become personally a greater advantage in whatever measure of capacity you have from Christ to be a benefit to all. Aren't you glad God gave us an assembly? How do you know, brethren, that you are growing up into Christ in all things? It's confirmed in the assembly. And what kind of a prophet you have, and there are great there are diversities of ministries, but they all profit with all. So you ask yourself, what kind of a prophet have you been, brethren? And are you increasing in your profitability to the people of God? If you find that happening, then you're right in the heart of what Jesus is doing. You're right in the heart of him filling all things. But even that, brethren, you know, that's not the end of the matter. It's just, it's just growing up into our assemblies and stuff. Perfection and ministry is fitting you for the gathering of the saints into one body on the day Jesus returns again. 
Brethren, this is when growing up into Christ Jesus is going to count. There's a day coming, the dispensation of the fullness of times, Paul said, when he's going to gather all things together in one in Christ Jesus. The purpose of salvation is to see to it that whatever measure you have been given of the fullness of Christ will fit perfectly into the fullness that he's given to the other brethren when we all come together into one. It has to fit, see? It's just like the building of the temple in Solomon's day. You remember they, that the stones were, were, were off-site. They were shaped off-site so that when they brought the stones together to build the temple, there was neither an axe nor a hammer heard in all the temple. It all fit together perfectly. Now, that's, what, that's what's happening in the work of salvation. The day is coming when we're going to all come in the unity of the faith and unto the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man. And that's what this fullness is all about. Now the day is coming, brother, and I just want to end with this, but like the, the day is coming that he's going to send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost parts of the earth to the uttermost parts of heaven. Now I just ask you the question, brethren, what, it, what you're doing right now, is it going to fit into that when he comes. Amen. That's something that you have to ask yourself. Because I'm telling you, when Jesus comes, that is not the day to grow up into Christ Jesus. Amen. If you're not grown up by then, you're out. I know that's hard. But it's really not hard. It's only hard when you view what appears to me to be the state of the church in our day is full of babies. That's all it is. We're not ready. Okay? That's what it seems to me to be. But in that day, you want to be perfect. And Jesus has been ascended up far above all heavens to fill all things so that you will be perfect in that day. So really, I guess the exhortation is simply this. I'll leave, it, I'll leave this one with you. Abide in my love. You abide in Christ, Christ will see to it that you're perfectly fitted so that you fit in to the fullness of times in that day. Thank you, brother.